Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for our webinar titled Recording High Quality Metabolic Data in Humans. This is Haley McCaffrey from Inside Scientific and I will be your host for today's event. Our session is sponsored by Biopack Systems and will feature experts discussing new technology and methods for measuring metabolic data from human research participants. During this webinar, we will hear from Fraser Finley, CEO of Biopack Systems, and William McMullen, Vice President of Bio Biopack Systems. Together, they will review fundamental principles for human metabolic studies and introduce this new gas analysis solution, GASIS-3. Specifically, they will discuss basic principles on how to determine a subject's metabolic rate, VO2, carbon dioxide production, respiratory exchange ratio, and airflow, O2 and CO2 with simultaneous ECG recordings, all while minimizing EMG artifact. Finally, they will demonstrate valuable automated software calculations to obtain VO2, VCO2, RER, heart rate from ECG, and respiration rate from airflow. Okay, good morning and welcome to the webinar, everyone. Thank you, Haley, for that great introduction. Before we start, I have a little background information about Biopack. Biopack develops high quality scientific tools that allow you to measure physiology anytime, anywhere, with any subject. Biopack has been in business for 27 years and 97% of the top 100 universities use Biopack products for research and for education. Biopack has over 29,000 citations and the Biopack Student Lab System is ranked number one for physiology experiments by members of the Human Anatomy and Physiology Society. I'm really looking forward to this webinar. We've got a, a live subject and we'll be giving a demonstration of the new Biopack Gas System 3 metabolic gas analysis system. Before we get to the demonstration, though, we'll cover the signals that are being collected and how we measure them. We'll have a review of the history and techniques used for analyzing this type of data. We'll have the introduction to the new Biopack Gas Sys 3. We'll take a look at the theory behind the new system and the technology being employed. All this before the main event, which is a live demonstration of the system with a review of the data being recorded and with a little time left over for a few questions. Okay, so let's familiarize ourselves with the software and the display and the signals that we're going to be looking at. So if those of you out there are familiar with Biopack software, either the Biopack Student Lab or Acknowledge, it's a pretty fluid user interface and you have complete control of the horizontal and vertical axes. You can move channels around. You can take measurements from the signals. I'm just going to walk through some of these so that when we get to the live demonstration, everyone will understand what they're looking at. This top channel here is the airflow signal. This is actually coming from the Pneumatac airflow transducer. I'm just going to zoom in a little bit using my magnifying glass. So here, this is one side. This is actually looking at the inspired side of the airflow signal. And then down below, if I zoom back, down below, we've got oxygen and CO2. So in this case here, we can see the person. If I click on my little marker button here, this is where the subject started moderate um, exercise so that they're on a, a bicycle and the resistance is slowly being increased here. So they're starting to work a little bit harder. You can see the increase in flow. We can see a decrease in oxygen and then an increase in CO2. And then this is VO2 normalized and then respiratory exchange ratio, RER and then heart rates coming from ECG um, as the person is exercising. So we can adjust the horizontal axes by making changes down below. So I 
Let's put some arbitrary numbers in here to give you an idea. So now I've stretched out my display. I can control the vertical area manually or automatically. So I'm just going to exaggerate this. Okay. But using my right mouse button, I can auto scale a single waveform or I can auto scale all the waveforms and I can zoom back. So now I've compressed the data down for this particular experiment and we have a, a good view of the data on display. So anyway, that gives you a quick um, overview of the display that you're going to be seeing when we get to the live demonstration portion of the webinar. Okay, so what do we mean by metabolic data? So if we know the percentage CO2 and O2 in the inspired and expired gas or air, along with the barometric pressure, temperature, relative humidity, and the volume of inspired and expired air, and if we also know a person's weight and height, then we can determine metabolic rate and a variety of other important measures. Metabolic rate is the energy expended calories per unit of time at rest and during exercise. If we know how many, many calories we burn and we have a knowledge of how many calories we consume, then we have a tool to work with when we're looking at changing our weight. We can determine the type of fuel being metabolized, whether it be carbohydrates or fat, basically the type of diet. We can determine the metabolic intensity of exercise and the level of cardiovascular fitness. In the language of exercise physiologists, we can determine VO2, which is the volume of oxygen consumed per minute, the dot in the V signifies a rate, and then VCO2, which is the volume of carbon dioxide, CO2 output per minute. These two are the most critical parameters. From these two, with the addition of knowing the body weight and height, the majority of parameters can be calculated. BMR, RMR, which is basal and resting metabolic rate. Um, so it factors in, uh, so these measures actually factor in body surface area. And then RER, which is respiratory exchange ratio. And this is the ratio between CO2 produced in metabolism and O2 used. And then we'll talk about these next two uh, a little later in the presentation, but REE, which is resting energy expenditure. And there's a specific formula that is used for calculating that, the Weir formula, uh, and it's used for calculating me metabolic rates. And then finally, VO2 max, which is the maximal oxygen uptake per minute. Okay, so how are we performing these measurements? Science became interested in the measurement of human energy expenditure over 200 years ago. In the 18th century, a device called a direct calorimeter was invented. Direct calorimetry measures the heat output of a person who is placed inside an insulated chamber. The basic concept that energy is transferred between two objects that are at different temperatures. Energy flows from the warmer to the cooler objects. If the calorimeter has water that is flowing through heat conductive piping, and if the water is cooler than the subject, there will be heat energy transferred between the two. If we measure the water temperature coming in and out, and if we know the water flow rate, then we can calculate the energy exchanged. Temperature and humidity of the outgoing air and the calculated energy from evaporation heat loss was added to the total energy exchanged. So this dates back um, 200 years, and in 1790, a French chemist discovered that heat production can be predicted from oxygen consumption. This implies that the rate of heat production is directly proportional to metabolic rate. This discovery led to the design of indirect closed circuit calorimeters. 
It is indirect because it's calculating heat production based on oxygen consumption. And it's closed circuit because the subject is enclosed in the measurement chamber. The measurement of expired CO2 was later included and added to the accuracy of the heat or energy calculations. The problem with direct and indirect closed circuit systems is that they're very expensive. The cost problem led to the alternate technique we call indirect open circuit calorimeter, where we only take measurements from the inspired and expired air, as if we were just putting a closed circuit chamber over the participant's head. One of the first and still used open circuit indirect calorimeter techniques is called the Douglas bag. The key valve is used to allow only expired air to go into the non-permeable collection bags for a specific time period. Bags are analyzed to measure the volume, the percentage of O2 and CO2 in the bag, along with temperature and humidity. The problem with a Douglas bag is that it can only capture samples of air for a few minutes. So this makes it a real challenge when you're trying to run a long-term exercise physio physiology type of experiment. As electronics evolved, better sensors became available and computers were integrated, which resulted in more sophisticated, indirect open circuit calorimeters. Some sensors are even fast enough to measure CO2 and O2 on a breath-by-breath -breath basis. The image on the left is a metabolic cart using a mixing chamber. And then the image on the right is showing a portable system that is worn by the subject and the analysis is actually being performed real time on the fly as the subject has the complete freedom of movement. The problem with these systems is they're extremely expensive. Okay, so now we come to Biopack's latest um, effort in the metabolic recording area. This is the Biopack Gas Sys 3. It's a compact gas analysis system that is packed full of technology that makes recording accurate metabolic data easier and more affordable. The system is built into a gas mixing chamber and includes CO2 and O2 gas analyzers, plus relative humidity, pressure, and temperature. The system interfaces with standard 35 millimeter tubing for simple connectivity to standard gas analysis tubing and accessories. The analyzers are essentially calibration free, which eliminates the need for continual gas calibration. The system automates setup and makes it much easier for typical users. I'm going to briefly hand you over to William and he'll provide you with further background information about the new Biopack Gas Sys 3. Okay, I think you can hear me now. Um, uh, thank you to Fraser and uh, hello everybody. Uh, <clears throat> the main objectives for the engineering department here were, were to design a metabolic system that were, was more affordable than what was currently offered, <clears throat> both in the initial cost and the, and the recurring cost. In addition, we needed to minimize setup and calibration time. So regarding initial costs, um, most metabolic systems use an air sampling technique. They run special tubing between a, the mixing chamber and the O2 and CO2 gas analyzers and use a pump to achieve precision airflow rate. They do that because the gas analyzers cannot tolerate high levels of water vapor. The air we expire is warm, 37 degrees Celsius approximately, and, and, and saturated with water, so 100% relative humidity. Um, the tubing that must be used in these systems uh, is a, is a semi-permeable membrane to water vapor, which allows water vapor to uh, the pressure to equalize to ambient conditions and lower the, the relative humidity. <clears throat> now, the problem is that the O2 and CO2 analyzers, as well as the precision pump, are very expensive. So what we had to find was, um, and, and fortunate for the new technology that's uh, come along in the last few years, um, we were able to use newer low cost O2 and CO2 sensors that work directly inside the mixing chamber, which eliminates the need for the uh, special pump and special tubing. Um, 
regarding recurring costs, the, the largest recurring cost is the cylinders of calibration gases. And um, many metabolic systems require gas calibration prior to each recording, and the gas calibration cylinders are expensive. Um, we believe that after our factory calibration, our system should not require gas calibration for hopefully a year. We've done some testing here and it's lasted, um, we have a system here that's lasted for eight months. Um, we believe that the system should hold its calibration for a long time. Uh, we will sell a calibration kit if customers want to do the gas calibration, or we can calibrate it back at BioPack, recalibrate it back at BioPack. Um, and I, lastly, the, the, we want to minimize setup and calibration costs. So the system has to be easy to set up and calibrate, and this, especially in the student lab scenario where there's limited lab time. Um, some exercise protocols can last 60 minutes or longer, and you just cannot afford to spend a lot of time setting up and calibrating the equipment. So, show you the system here in a little more detail. Um, I'm going to switch to my camera, and Fraser will explain a little bit more about the system. Almost there, Fraser. Okay, William, thank you very much. So this is the gas system three. This is Biopac's new uh, metabolic system. Everything is self-contained within the mixing chamber. At the one end, we have all the electronics. We've got oxygen, carbon dioxide sensors. We have a fan. Uh, we've got relative humidity, temperature, and pressure all built into it. This baffle here is also a heating element, so it takes care of um, the humidity problem. And we'll get into all the details of that in a moment. At the one end, we have an exhaust. And on the other end, we have an inlet. These are 35 millimeter ports, so your standard airflow tubing will interface nicely. The way we've got it set up for this particular application, we've got a face mask with a T-valve on the front. And then one side of the T-valve, the exhaust side, comes into the mixing chamber. The other side of the T-valve is connected to a BioPack Airflow Pneumotac transducer. We've got it configured this way for this particular test that we're going to be running. But it's really a relatively straightforward setup. Inlet coming through the transducer, exhaust coming into the uh, mixing chamber. The analyzers are at the far end. Then we've got two connectors coming out the back, or two leads coming out the back that connect to the MP36. This will interface with the educational version of the MP36 or the research version, the MP36R. We have one cable connector coming in from the Pneumotac airflow transducer, and we have one each for the O2 and CO2. William will be talking a little bit more about the sensors that are built into this because this is really quite sophisticated. We're getting many more channels than we actually have physical connections for here. So I'm going to hand you back over to William and William can take it away with all the details of the technology that's built into this new system. Okay, this is a look inside. Um, at the sensors that analyze the expired air near the exhaust port. And uh, we have the uh, O2 sensor. Um, it's, it's optimized for a range of about 13 to 21% O2, percent O2 in the air. Um, we have the, the CO2 sensor, which is, um, <clears throat> it's, it has a range of uh, zero to 10% CO2, but it's calibrated between two and 8% CO2. And uh, now I want to note that we, we don't measure ambient CO2. Um, because the ambient levels are near zero, like 0.04%, um, and we are measuring CO2 in expired air in the range of 2 to 8%, in order to achieve the highest accuracy from the CO2 sensors, we optimize them for the range we will be measuring at, at a cost of, of, making, uh, of reducing the accuracy for the ambient range. Um, so we have the user manually enter the ambient CO2 value and, and many systems do this, and it's very reasonable. And you can, you can purchase a, a third-party ambient CO2 meter for $100 that is tuned for a sweet spot of 0.01 to 0.1% um, CO2. Um, we also have a blower here that is um, it's needed to, to circulate the air uh, 
to reduce the chance of condensation and to improve the, the response time of the CO2 sensor. There's also temperature and relative humidity sensors um, that are here that are measuring the chamber right you know, near the sensors, what the temperature and relative humidity is. Uh, now, because these sensors are used a lot in um, car exhaust systems and uh, heater and air conditioning systems, industrial buildings, and the temperature and humidity sensors are used in a lot of wearables now. The, the economies of scale have brought the cost of these sensors way down, and, we, and that's what we're able to take advantage of. Um, there's also this heater, which is uh, used during moderate or strenuous exercise testing, and I'll, I'll talk about more about that in a moment. Okay, so what I want to show you here is um, uh, a typical calibration, what we call calibration. Um, <clears throat> the user enters their name, so it'll save the file when they're done. They enter the, uh, their weight and their height and their age. This is this is the cal est give some estimated resting energy expenditures. This is a resting test that this particular in this particular example, um, and then uh, they start the calibration process and make sure the system has been warmed up. Um, this is where you'd enter in your your ambient CO2 value, and uh, this is what just verifying that the ambient conditions are what you agree with. And now you're calibrating the, <clears throat> the airflow transducer baseline, zero flow. And now you are going to um, pump some air, some ambient air through the gas system three so that it can get a reading of what the O2 ambient it is. So you pump the syringe, you pump air in it for about a minute. I'll fast forward it a little bit since it's pretty repetitive. And at the end of this, it gives you some, some information about the, the O2 at red, and you're ready to go. So that's the calibration procedure. It's not, it doesn't involve calibration gases. It's mainly just to set the baseline offset for the airflow transducer and the, um, at the O2 value of ambient. You can see here that we have in this picture for resting, we have the airflow transducer just attached to the expired side of the gas system three. And that's, that's because uh, I'll explain that a little bit more in a moment. So sometimes we have it on the expired side, sometimes the expired, the expired side. Uh, this is a typical resting, um, the resting position, subject just being relaxed as possible. And uh, now you can do a basal metabolic rate, which in, is kind of difficult to do in, pr in practice because it involves no food for at least 12 hours prior, uh, no exercise 48 hours prior, um, certain room temperature. Uh, mo most people do what's called the resting metabolic rate, which is no food, caffeine, or nicotine for at least two hours prior and no moderate or rigorous physical activity for four hours. So the protocol is that the subject gets in a resting position and breathes through the system for 10 minutes prior to the recording. And this time is needed for the subject to relax and get used to the feeling of the mouthpiece or the mask. You can use a mouthpiece or a face mask. And um, get used to the slight air restriction coming from the T-valve because you want to relax enough so that during the recording you're, you're achieving near tidal volume. Um, so then the protocol is when you're recording is you record for five minutes and then you take measurements on the last 30 seconds of data. And this is just one protocol you can use, um, you know, whatever protocol you want for your resting measurements. So what, are, what is this telling us? Um, there's not enough time to go into all the calculation details, but the system will output basically the, the, the volume of O2 inspired, what we call the VO2 absolute liters per minute. Uh, I couldn't put the dot over the V on this for some reason. I had a hard time doing that, but there should be a dot over the Vs here. Uh, VO2 relative, which factors in body mass. Um, the resting metabolic rate. Um, and then uh, from what is known as Weir's formula, the system can determine energy expenditure in calories per minute. 
And uh, based on this, it can determine resting energy expenditure, which represents the amount of energy expended by a person at rest per day. Um, so now what's nice about our system is all of the calculations are fully disclosed in the software and are based on well-established formulas. Uh, the equations can be modified in our system. So it's very open book. A lot of systems just spit out a few numbers and you have no idea where, where those calculations are coming from. Our system is completely open. Um, so um, and so, so because we have, uh, the system can measure the volume of oxygen consumed and the amount of CO2 uh, produced, it can determine, as Fraser mentioned, the resp respiratory exchange ratio. So the RERs indicate which fuel, carbohydrate or fat is being metabolized to supply body with energy. Um, the human body is continually oxidizing a mixture of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats rather than any single food as a sole source of energy. Uh, protein is typically ignored and is assumed that only carbohydrates and fats contribute to energy production. The protein contribution to energy production can be found, uh, is found to be very small for healthy subjects and people not starved or undergoing prolonged exercise. Um, the slide shows the standard oxidation equations and corresponding RER values for a single molecule or, or carbohydrate uh, of carbohydrate and fat. Um, so, now this is uh, a picture showing the uh, A setup for exercise, um, and you can use a face mask or a, a T valve uh, mouthpiece and a headset headgear and um, so we're you know it's flexible on what kind of t-valve pose and uh, mask now one of the problems with uh, this is I mentioned before that we have this heater in here and, and one of the problems with putting the sensors in the chamber is although they can tolerate a fair amount of heat um, they can't tolerate condensation that's one of the reasons the fan is in there too, is for condensation. Um, you know, as mentioned earlier, air is exp expired air is saturated with water vapor, so 100% humidity. Um, with the amount of air flowing through the system during a typical resting test, by the time the air goes through the tubing and, and the mixing chamber and reaches the sensors, it's about you know, 85 degrees Fahrenheit, 85 to 90% relative humidity. And the sensors can tolerate this temperature humidity without having condensation form. But during moderate to VO2 max testing, the air at the sensors reaches, um, you know, the, the uh, well, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, sorry, I think in terms of Fahrenheit, and 95% relative humidity or more. And it's, that's too high for the sensors to, um, uh, condensation forms easily. And um, so for this, we have the heater turned on and the heater will raise the temperature, um, and which lowers the relative humidity. And, and uh, it's important to note that the, the heater does not dry the air. It simply raises the temperature, which increases the capacity for air to hold water vapor. So what you see on the slide is, is the system after an exercise test. You can see that the heater is, is preventing condensation. Um, the air is flowing from left to right, and uh, it's doing a good job at keeping the condensation out of that area. Uh, going back briefly to some, some of the more details, um, there are some assumptions made for our system operation. And one thing is, is that ambient air, um, metabolic studies, the air is, we assume that air is only made up of nitrogen, oxygen, and CO2, and that the concentration of these gases in ambient air doesn't change much during a recording. Um, and as mentioned previously, ambient CO2 is manually entered. Um, barometric pressure does not change between ambient and chamber air. And this is reasonable because the gas of three does not add that much air restriction. Um, because nitrogen is inert in terms of metabolism, any changes in its con concentration between inspired and expired air must be due to an imbalance between the number of O2 and CO2 molecules produced during metabolism. So we're able to use what's called the, the Haldane formula to just measure the airflow on one side, either inspired or expired, and then be able to calculate the other from the Haldane formula. Um, so armed with everything I've mentioned, uh, this is kind of 
a basic flow chart of how the hardware and software work. Um, the system prior to the recording measures the ambient pressure. Uh, the CO2 is manually entered, CO2 value for ambient. You flush the chamber with ambient air as we showed in the video. Then the system um, you know, records the, the ambient temperature relative humidity and then the O2, the percent O oxygen in the ambient air. It factors out water vapor pressure and has this value called uh, O2 corrected. And then it calculates the nitrogen, the value of nitrogen in ambient air. Now during the recording, every 10 seconds it's updating, it's measuring again inside the chamber what the temperature is, the relative humidity, um, the volume of air flowing through the airflow transducer, the amount of oxygen expired and CO2 expired. It factors out water vapor pressure for O2 and CO2. It calculates the volume expired in terms of standard temperature pressure dry, and it calculates nitrogen expired, and then it's able to calculate, as I said, either if we're doing, um, if, if the airflow is on the expired side, it's going to calculate the volume of, of expired air or vice versa. And then we calculate the um, volume of O2 consumed and the volume of CO2 expired and uh, plus symbol signifies that all the other parameters are calculated, such as metabolic rate, our uh, resting energy expenditure, and so forth. Um, lastly, before we go on to the recording, I just want to mention there's a test, um, you know, the VO2 max is kind of the granddaddy of tests. Um, it's the highest rate of oxygen consumption a person can obtain during exercise. And it's usually um, performed on a treadmill or a cycle ergometer. Um, and the protocol is, you know, you begin with no resistance and you increase the workload in equal increments every two minutes. Uh, you're monitoring heart rate and uh, VO2 and you stop when either the VO2 reaches a steady state. Uh, there's a lot of different um, uh, protocols, but this is, this is one typical one. You, see, you wait and see when the VO2 reaches a steady state regardless of increased load, and you're monitoring the subject to, to feel, to see if they feel lightheaded or chest pain is gonna stop. Uh, it's a very difficult test, actually. Um, exercising to exhaustion. Is, is hard to do, especially using a T valve, so not all subjects should be tested. But the system is capable of doing it. And um, so, with that in mind, what we want to do is we want to switch to a, a live, a live uh, recording. And um, yeah, uh, hold on a moment here. So, what we have here is our software, and it's already been. Uh, Calibration has already taken place, and uh, we're fortunate to have um, Harold. Let me turn on my camera. We're fortunate enough to have Harold from our engineering department. So we're going to have him um, read through the equipment. So start breathing in just at rest. And just get um, it was flush with ambient air, so we should see it start to. Um, so what we see here is the CO2 value here, and the O2 value is starting to decrease as he goes from ambient to expired air conditions. Now the airflow, uh, to calculate volume from airflow, we use an integrator. We integrate the uh, airflow and um, we average over 60 seconds. So it takes 60 seconds just to begin to get the proper values of, of um, volume. Now you can see up here that there's uh, a lot of channels we're hiding because it clutters the screen so much, but they're all being recorded and saved and so they can be turned on at a later time. Now I just hit auto scale so that everything comes into view and I may hit that a few times as the levels climb. But we're going to give it a few minutes to for Harry to establish just a resting a resting uh, rate.
it's always hard when you first put the mask on that it, you tend to hyperventilate a little bit. And we'd really like the, um, the RER value to get down to regular normal levels. So relax, Harry. Now we're not, you know, doing a, a proper resting protocol, so we, we may not get our ER values down to, well, it's going down now into the reasonable range. Okay, in the uh, so that we have reasonable time here, um, I'm going to go ahead and have Harry start lightly with no restriction, just lightly exercise for a little bit. I'm going to put up a marker. And now what we'll try and do here is have you um, increase the friction a fair amount and then really step up the cadence to go from light to moderate real quickly. Let me uh, zoom rescale it so that you're seeing more data. You see here the airflow is uh, going up. I'm going to increase the resistance just a little more. And we're going to have him do this kind of, it's pretty moderate exercise. Uh, I mean, it's fairly Really strenuous. We're going to do this for a few minutes. You see the volume of oxygen consumed going up. Okay, Harry, why don't you uh, release the, the resistance and try and relax.
and just auto scale to zoom in on on each channel uh, or to optimize this the, the scale for the uh, so that we see all of the top and the bottom of in this particular time window. We're going to let him rest for a little bit. CO2 expired, goes up. Yeah, I want to point out too that um, in the journal, what it's doing is every every 10 seconds, it's taking um, measurements of these values here, and that's flexible as to what you want it to to read in the journal, and what you want it to record, and how many seconds. Um, We'll just have them rest a little bit longer here and then we'll look at some analysis. Normally we'd wait for the uh, RER value to go down to where it was when it was at rest, but it, 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 that would take a lot of time. William, we've had a question come in from an audience member. Um, Ken is curious to know what the top row is measuring. I'm sure you'll be talking about this during your analysis, but would you mind addressing that now? Yeah, that's that's just measuring uh, the airflow, the inspired air cycle. Uh, there's a T-valve and the airflow is on the inspired side. And uh, so that's, you can see when he's exercising, You know, when we stop it here, we'll zoom in on that and talk about that, but it's simply airflow. And, See, there's a bunch of channels up here with slashes through them. Those are channels that are there being recorded that aren't being shown. And um, again, we'll talk about that a little more. I'm going to switch over to Fraser here for a minute. Okay, guys, so let's have a look, see what we've got going on here. As William just explained, the top channel here is the airflow, which is coming in from the one side, the inspired side of the, the valve. And then we've got we've got uh, O2 and CO2 and then the normalized VO2 and the RER value. William was applying event marks throughout the recording and you can um, scroll through these. These you can add text with each uh, marker that was entered. Entered, and if I just adjust this display a little bit, there we go. So over in the top left-hand corner, this bar here, we can see. I'll highlight that for you. We can see the label that William typed in. Okay. So this is the beginning, this red triangle here. This marks the point where moderate exercise began. The next one is where uh, Harry started to rest. And then you can jump into this little bookmark here. And um, sorry, let me bring that back up here. And you can see that the... Uh, the history of the event marks that are in there and you can jump to any one of those and you can see the red triangle changing as we jump to those and one of the nice things about the system as William mentioned every 10 seconds the system is automatically taking measurements and pasting them down into the journal file then these measurements can then be opened up in Excel or some other spreadsheet that you're interested in but you can also take 
um, static measurements. So if we want to look, for example, at the mean oxygen in an area, uh, mean CO2, and then if we highlight an area like so, these values are immediately updated. So we can see that the mean um, percent oxygen at this period of the recording was 17 points, approximately 8%. The mean CO2 was uh, 3.4. Now you can then paste any of these measurements down into the journal file, or you can do some more automated uh, analyses. Now, one way of doing that is to come to the analysis menu. Um, yeah, you're, you're going to have to hit done oh, here to, okay. um, uh, it's going to save the file and then allow you to analyze it. Perfect. So analyze. All right. So now when we come into this analysis menu, there's an option down here called Epoch Analysis. And this allows you to enter any time period you'd like. So if I set this to a fixed time interval, and I'm just for argument's sake, use 10 seconds from the beginning of the recording, I can have a time interval between them, but I actually want to run consecutive segments of data. So zero to 10, and then uh, 11 through 20, so on and so forth. And I have a choice of where I want these values to be pasted. I can drop them down into the journal file and create new graphs. I can just create a new graph or I can export out to Excel. And if I select Excel, I can choose either the entire graph or a focus area. And I'll get to the focus areas in a moment. But this is 10 second intervals and my measurements will be pasted down into the spreadsheet. Now I need to tell the system what measurements I want to take. So I'm just gonna drop a couple down here. I'm gonna say, um, OK, so now I've got a bunch of measurements that I've selected. When I hit OK, the system will automatically run through, extract these measures, and open up <laughs> OK, phew. Looks like that's the first time Excel had been used on this machine. Yes. Um, OK. So now we can see the um, each epoch, so each 10 second uh, period of data. And then we've got the values for oxygen, CO2 and RER throughout the course of the entire protocol. And we can adjust these time periods to suit what we're trying to do. You also can re-display those measures as new channels. You also have something called focus areas. Focus areas are pretty nice. If I use a selection period, these areas that are of interest, so let's say this one here where our participant was at rest, we can make sure that we've got our focus areas turned on. And I will hit plus. So I've now created this baseline area. This area that William marked, we could have marked this as a focus area. And we'll call this the test area. Now, if we come in and do that exact same analysis again, so we're going back into that epoch analysis. 10 second intervals, just exactly the same, only this time I'm going to 
perform the analysis just on the focused areas only. So I'm going to hit OK. These are the measurements I'm interested in. So now we have the results for the test area, and then we'll also have the results for our for our baseline. Okay, so we can spit out the measurements just for the actual focus areas that we're interested in. Okay, so that gives you a very quick overview of some of the analysis that can be performed with the system. At this point, I'm going to hand back over to Haley for some quick questions. Excellent. Thank you both so much for your presentation and a special thank you, to, especially to our live participant, Harry. Um, we're now going to transition into a Q&A session. Um, so we'll try to get to as many questions as possible, but uh, here we go. Um, does this system or is this sim system limited for use with only humans or do you have other adaptations um, for use with other animals? Um, right now on this this first revision, um, it, it's it's really for human measurements, but we do plan on on having, uh, you know, we're able to change the, the, the size of the chamber and um, we can put in a little cage for animals and then we'd have to optimize the O2 and CO2 sensors for the range of the animal, but it's completely doable. So we okay. will be doing that. Great. Um, how does this system differ from GASIS 2? Yeah, that's a good question. They do look very similar. Um, however, the gas system three is is, a, is really a total redesign. Um, the system has an expanded CO2 range of one to ten percent, which is then allows us to do the more strenuous exercise tests up to VO2 max. Um, it has the heater that we talked about that is critical for doing the VO2 max testing. Um, it also has a built-in ambient um, pressure, temperature, and humidity sensor. Uh, you know which which the gas system two didn't have. So basically, it, I mean, we've, we've taken a lot of the setup that was needed with the gas system two out of it. And um, the software runs a script, it kind of runs almost, if you're familiar with the um, lessons that we have or the, or the templates that we have that guide you through it and take care of a lot of the setup and the correction for standard temperature pressure. Um, and so it's just, a much easier system to use. And plus the, the gas calibration is not required uh, that often or, or hopefully hardly at all. So that's my Great. best answer. <laughs> Great. Um, is there, or what is the limit to the duration of recording, if any? Um, we're talking in terms of if someone wanted to do like a marathon on a treadmill. Oh boy, gosh, I can't imagine doing a marathon with that face mask on, but uh, you're really only limited by the, um, you know, the, the, the memory you have on your computer for for saving the data. So really, it, it can do it. It's just uh, that that would be kind of uh, that'd be an interesting test. Okay. It's hard enough for me to do it. I mean, I can't even do half of one, but with having a face mask on, it would be really really tough. But you can do it. Great. Um, how often must the gas system be calibrated in order to ensure accurate results? Yeah, um, well, there's so there's two types of calibration. There's the gas calibration, you know, which requires the precision gas references, and um, and then there's the airflow and ambient calibration that we did that we showed in our, our little video. Um, so we we tried to eliminate the need for constant gas calibrations. We we've, we've been testing a system here. Um, the O2 and CO2 have held their accuracy for over eight months. Um, we believe they can hold their accuracy even longer depending on the usage. Um, it's important to note that the sensors and associated circuitry have temperature and pressure compensation and basically designed to work in cars and in building systems and, and, you know, they need to hold their accuracy. They're not going to be pulled out and calibrated every few months. So that's, that's the kind of type of sensors we're using. Um, but we do require ambient air calibration, which basically the airflow transducer needs to establish a, a zero flow baseline and uh, that we showed in the video. And then there's the flushing for one minute to get the O2 value. Okay. Um, can the airflow transducer and or the gas chamber, can they be moved after calibration? 
Yeah, I mean, if we're talking about gas calibration, calibrating gas, then yes, um, you know, but as, as we showed, um, I'm assuming you're saying move to another state or something or, or another location that's, um, you know, it, uh, at a different altitude or something. And yes, um, the only, then you, you would just have to, again, calibrate the airflow transducer and the flushing of the system. Okay. Um, what is the youngest or the smallest subject that you can study using this system? Yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, you know, definitely can't use it on infants, but, um, you know, I, I would say, you know, eight to 10 years old, we really haven't tested that fully yet on, on real young children. So I, I can't say accurately, but, um, uh, I, you know, my, my best guess is like a 10 year old. Sure. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and then one last question before we wrap up. Are there best practices for combining measurements of EMG and heart rate or HRV with metabolic function? Yeah, best practices. Well, um, you see that when we add the ECG to channel four on the MP36, we've used up all the four of the analog channels, mm -hmm. but you can um, use another MP36 and add four more channels and um, our software can synchronize uh, the triggering of the two and, and be able to acquire the eight channels. Um, I sh if, I, if I have time to mention one more thing, uh, there's of course. something I forgot to mention on the system, and that is that so the the we're able to on each channel read not only analog data but serial data, and so on this system, the O2, so this is channel two, is not only reading O2 but it's it's reading ambient temperature, pressure, humidity, as well as chamber um, temperature and humidity. So we're able to read on channel two. We're able to read actually um, six signals. So I, I forgot to mention that, and that's one uh, you know something new in the gas system three versus the gas system two. So that we're able to constantly monitor the the, the conditions.